Welcome, especially if you're visiting us today. It's great to have you with us. We have some visitors from afar. So welcome, Helen, all the way from South Africa. And uh, we also have some visitors locally as well. So welcome to you. We will be having refreshments after the service, so please do stay if you can. Just in the back room, we'll be teas and coffees and biscuits and bits and bobs. But um, let's come to God, let's pray, get our hearts ready to worship him and receive from heaven this day. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this great privilege uh, to meet together today, to uh, gather in worship and prayer and praise and thanksgiving. Lord, we've all come here maybe with different thoughts on our mind, maybe worries, maybe excitements for the week ahead and months and maybe even years ahead. Things that we're thinking about that can occupy our minds and we can spend so much time thinking and rehearsing situations, many of which won't even happen. So Lord, help us not to waste thinking time. Help us to focus our minds and our hearts upon you, upon your kingdom, upon the work that you want us to do. Lord, we want to be uh, on mission for you. We want to be uh, ready to receive from you and be in your will in everything that we do and say and even think and feel. So Lord, please help us this morning. Give us all that we need for the days of work ahead. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a couple of hymns back to back. Um, and then we'll go through some announcements after that. But let's stand together and praise Jesus as we sing, first of all, How Great Thou Art, and then How Great Is Our God.
How great is the living God to you? How great do you think he is? It's largely irrelevant, that question, to be fair, because it doesn't really matter what you think, because <laughs> he is great. It doesn't matter what any of us think about how great he is. His greatness is unquestionable. But the more we explore his greatness, the more we appreciate it, well, that's the more we start to understand how great he is. Let's, let's pray again. Father, we thank you for your immense greatness that we, we just know a speck of. And Lord, I, I pray for everyone at the moment, in the fellowship especially, who's, who's struggling. For those who, who can't be here this morning through ill health. Lord, for those who are here this morning but are still struggling, and many of them hiding their struggles and, and not trying to make a fuss. They're just getting on with it. They're persevering. But Lord, they're, they're hurting. I pray, Lord, that today those people would know your greatness. That they'd get an extra portion of grace. And Father, I pray for those not part of the fellowship who are struggling as well. Those who live in this very village. Who are struggling with all kinds of different things, but but they don't see you as the answer. Their, their own pride and spiritual blindness hasn't figured out who Jesus is yet, that he has the whole world in his hands, that he's capable of helping in all situations, and, and he's willing, and he's full of love and compassion and mercy. <coughs> Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convict people in this village of their sin, that they would repent and they would turn to the living God for salvation and for eternal life. And they would find joy in Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as a church to shine brightly in this village. That we would take our responsibility as amb ambassadors of Jesus seriously. And that we would honor you in all that we do. And, Lord, that we would be able to share our faith effectively, relying completely on you. And I pray all this for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. Okay, a couple of announcements. Um, so the, on the website, if you're interested in our Holiday Bible Club, it is open to book in. Okay, so you are the first to know children here of Wellington Chapel. And it will be going out tomorrow to three schools, is it? Five schools? Five different schools, primary schools. Okay, it is first come, first serve, so we are limited on how many we can cater for. Um, so you have priority. <laughs> Book in, sharpish. All right, so that's 1st and 2nd of June, isn't it? Yeah. Pray for us leaders as well, because we will need grace and patience. <laughs> um, but also pray mostly for the children. So they would come and learn more about Jesus and who he is and how much he has for these young children. Also, our coronation event is now confirmed for the Bank Holiday Monday, which is the 8th of May. So it's going to be from 2 o'clock in the afternoon until 5 o'clock. So there's still time, if you are able to help in some way, even if it's, you might think, oh, I can only really make some squash. That's an amazing help. Or I can, I can only pray. I hate it when people say that. I can only pray. It's like, what? Of course, that's amazing help. Okay, so please speak to Shirley um, if you're able to help, and uh, she will guide you in that. Also, if we can keep praying for, for Dave Porter um, and his ongoing struggles and, and immense patience in waiting for this operation, please continue praying for him. Thank you that so many are. Uh, but keep, keep going. We need to keep persevering in prayer for David. Uh, and also pray for David and Ruthie, uh, and little Elizabeth and Lucy. It's, it's easy, isn't it, when, when somebody's not around every week for us to forget. Um, but let's, let's keep on supporting them in prayer. Uh, and Stephen and Grace and, and little Samuel and Elijah, keep praying for them. Uh, Stephen may hopefully have a great opportunity today uh, to preach in a local police station. Um, and, and maybe a prison as well, not, not too sure. Um, but yeah, pray for them. And pray for, for Grace. She's not feeling too great. So 
pray that she would recover. Um, also, home group is on Wednesday, so there are a few little adjustments to, to home group, especially if you're in our group, um, which you already know about. But if you're not part of a home group and you'd like to get involved, we, we meet every other Wednesday evening in somebody's house, and there's a group of between five and 15 people uh, we get together, we, we study the Bible, usually something that's been covered on a Sunday, and then we just probe it a little bit deeper and, and just try and apply it, really, uh, and get our teeth into that particular passage or theme, um, and also to pray for each other and share prayer requests. We've, we've seen so many answers to prayer. It's been amazing. Um, so if you'd like to get involved in home groups, give me a shout at the end of the service or, or drop me a line at some point, but not in the next two weeks, because <laughs> I'm off. <laughs> Um, last one, I think, announcement-wise, is children's talks. Just so you all know, we record the services from start to finish, but the children's talks won't be on YouTube, okay, from now on. So especially if children are coming up at the front, that, that's not going to be recorded. So you might get the sound, but you certainly won't get the visual, okay? So just to give you a, a heads up about that, especially if you're bringing guests or if you're bringing... Uh, looked after children or anything like that. Um, it's just good for us all to know that and be aware of that as a fellowship. Okay, I think that's it, unless I've missed any announcements. Anything, Mark, John? Anything else? Nope. Great, okay. Now, children, I'm going away on holiday with my wife, Carla. And it's the first time we're going on holiday together in 20 years without children. Okay? We just don't like them anymore. All right? <laughs> Not true, we love them dearly, but being away from here for a couple of weeks, I might struggle with the memory verse, so I'm going to need some help. So who is going to help me to remember the memory verse? Okay, come on up. If you think you've got it in the locker, come and give it a go. I didn't even have to shake the tin, did I, to motivate you today? Right. Oh, we're okay. You can stand and face any way. We don't have it behind. Okay. Any more? You want to come up? Okay. okay. Maybe next time. Come on, then. <coughs> Should we go for it together, or would you prefer to do it individually? Together. together. Together? Okay. Do it together, but I'm going to be watching very closely <laughs> to check you're all doing it right. Ready? After three. One, two, three. And a bonus chocolate for whoever can tell me where in the Bible that's found. 2 Peter 3 verse 18. Excellent. 2 Peter 3 verse 18. Okay, right. Come and collect your reward. There we go. 10 seconds you've got to pick your sweet. I know, it's brutal. Well done. Excellent. Come on, sit down. Enjoy. Okay, so if you're not part of Wellington Fellowship, that's our text for the year. That, that's really our, our vision, our goal, um, that we want to grow in the grace of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. We want to grow in everything that God has for us. We don't want to grow in our own strength. We don't just want to grow physically. We want to grow spiritually. That's what we want. That's what we're striving for. Not so God will love us more. Not so that we will get more recognition or more honour or more glory. Actually, it's quite the opposite. As we grow spiritually, we become more humble. And we just kind of do that thing where we step out the way and we just give all the honour and all the glory to Jesus. I don't know why I'm looking up there. There's a... But that's what we do. Okay, that's, that's what we're trying to do as a fellowship. And it's hard, isn't it? Growing is hard because to grow, sometimes we need to allow God to 
access areas of our life that, well, we know that are not good. They're sinful. And they need changing, they need correcting, it needs, it needs killing and sorting out. Okay? So if you want to know more about the memory verse, go and speak to any one of those children. Okay? <laughs> and they will help you out at some point today. Okay, we're going to stand and sing again now to God. Be the glory uh, at the end of that song. The children are going to go off to Sunday school and crash. But let's stand first and sing together. Okay, in a moment, uh, Pat is surely going to come and read God's Word for us. We're looking at Judges chapter 8 this morning, which is on page 207 in the Church Bibles, and goes into page 208. But before we have that reading, let's just pray for the children, uh, for Sharon and Anna as they lead. Father, we do thank you uh, for the children. We thank you for them working so hard to, to memorize our text for this year. We, we thank you, Lord, for them enjoying church, them enjoying learning about Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would help Anna this morning and Sharon as she takes the, the teenagers out, the older ones, 
Lord, that they would continue enjoying, not that it's all just about fun, but Lord, if they can enjoy exploring your depths and continue that on into their adult life, how much easier it will be for their Bible reading, for their prayer times, for their service in the kingdom. Lord, we should all be doing that. We should all be serving you with a smile on our face, just full of joy and love and peace, and too often we're not. And sometimes it can be a slog, but Lord, help us to really embrace what you've called us to do and enjoy it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Judges chapter 8. Then Zebra and Zalmuna said, Rise yourself and fall upon us. As the man is, 
so is his strength. Gibeon arose and killed Zebra and Zalmunna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Then the men of Israel said to Gibeon, Rule over us, and your son and your grandson also, for you saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And Gideon said to them, Let me make a request of you. Every one of you, give me the earrings from his spoil. For they had golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak, and every man threw in the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were around the necks of their camels, Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Oprah. And all Israel hauled after it. And it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more. And the land had rest for forty years in the days of Gideon. Jerubal, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Now, Gideon had seventy sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. His concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, at Oprah, at the Abiezrites. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and poured after the Baals, and made Baal Bereth their god. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who delivered them from the land and of all their enemies in every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. This is the word of God. Don't worry if, as we're going through Judges, you kind of get a little bit confused by all the names and all the places, and uh, especially if you're not a strong reader as well, and you're kind of reading through, and it's, it is a bit of a struggle. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God, so you don't need to, to beat yourself up about that at all, uh, but thank you both for being brave enough to read <laughs> such a, a long and uh, difficult chapter with so many different place names and people. And really what we're going to try and do this morning is, is break this chapter up and, and really focus on the main aspects of it. It is quite a challenging one because Gideon, he's already fought Baal in chapter 6 and then in chapter 7 he's up against the Midianites and now in chapter 8 he's actually fighting against fellow Israelites. He's fighting against his church family. They're the ones who are rising against him. And first up we've got Ephraim. Now Ephraim... They were one of the strongest tribes in Israel, and they, they knew it. They were like the prima donna uh, of all the other tribes. So remember Joshua, the mighty leader, uh, warrior Joshua, he was from Ephraim. And so that's the reputation that they had. They were strong, they were powerful, they had lots of resources, and they had a reputation for being quite uncompromising. And Gideon knows that. So this is just a little taste of what Ephraim are like when we get to Judges chapter 12. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. They're a feisty bunch, Ephraim. And in chapter 7, Gideon did involve them against the Midianites, but they didn't get as much of a role as what they would have wanted. They didn't get, they say to Gideon, why didn't you consult us first? You did it without our say. They want to be 
the center of everything. They want to be the ones who are making all the decisions. They, they wanted a bigger role. Their pride is quite evident in this chapter. And remember, Gideon, he's from the weakest tribe, Manasseh. And Ephraim is supposedly the strongest tribe, humanly speaking, of course. And it's a reminder that sometimes the most gifted person for the task on paper is not God's chosen person for that task. And if you're that gifted person and God has looked to somebody else, how do you react in that situation? That's a real challenge for us as Christians because we can look and say, well, on paper, surely I should be the one leading this or doing this or helping with that. But someone else is doing it. And so the temptation is that then you can get very critical of that person and, and bring them down and therefore exalt yourself and justify why you should be doing it instead of them. That is not a godly way to respond. Maybe Ephraim is also worried about missing out on the spoils of victory or worse still, the glory of the victory. God was, was right. We are so desperate to steal his glory. And the first response that Gideon gives in this chapter is really good. It's wise, it's gentle. So if you look at verse 2 and 3 again, it's effective as well. It's like you know, a gentle word turns away wrath, the Bible says. So when someone's firing at you aggressively, criticizing you, my natural reaction sometimes, I'm sure I'm not the only one, is to respond likewise. They've brought the sword, I'll get my sword out. Let's have a battle. Not a godly response, is it? And Gideon, he's really godly here. He, he gives gentle words. Really gentle words, actually. And he's full of humility, and he, he compliments them, and he says, look, you've achieved more than me. It's not even worth comparing. All that you've done so far is far more than what I've done. Prideful people have itching ears they just want to hear compliments all the time. They want to be puffed up all the time and reminded how amazing they are. Because they think they're amazing. And if you don't think they're amazing, well, they'll try and convince you or get you to tell them they're amazing. But Gideon does well. He's got excellent diplomacy skills. He's, he's peaceful. He bites his tongue. This is great. This is really good. If we didn't carry on reading the rest of the chapter, we'd think, Gideon's such a godly bloke. Now, what we later realize is Gideon just doesn't fancy his chances against Ephraim. That's why he's so gentle. So there's a hidden agenda going on here. But then he springs into action in verse 4. He leads the 300 men across the Jordan. And you've got that famous verse, these men are exhausted yet pursuing. A beautiful verse. It's a verse of, of great motivation. It's often written in Christian books. Um, recorded that 10% of people in the church do 90% of the work of the service. And you think, wow, that's not right, is it? Well, it's not, but go and take a look at the rotor on the wall. It'll be the same name, as you'll see, week after week. Same old names. Doing teas and coffees and all the other stuff. Have a look at who's helping in different areas of church life. Same names. But it doesn't need to be. My, my prayer is for a wider variety of names, for more people to get involved. And I know everyone can't get involved, and there's, there's lots of different reasons why. But we don't want to be exhausted in our pursuing. And we'll come back to that in a little while. Now, these two places, we're going to tackle them together, Succoth and Penuel. They're asked for supplies for the 300 men who are exhausted and they want to continue or Gideon says I want to continue pursuing the Midianite kings and the response that he gets for supplies is a negative one are the hands of Zeba and Zalmanah already in your hands that we should give bread to your army if you study the Hebrew really carefully there it basically says no we're not helping you not a chance. You don't need to study the Hebrew at all, do you? They're saying, no, we're not giving you anything 
until we can literally see their hands chopped off in your hand, until you prove that you can beat, and beat them and win. That was a, a pagan practice of chopping off and dismembering parts of the body and then using that to prove uh, that you've killed that particular person, but also to, to maim somebody would stop them from fighting again in war. So if you cast your mind back to chapter 1, can you remember that, that guy, Adonai Bezek? So it said in, in chapter 1, uh, where Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes I'd cut off to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Now, that wasn't what God told the Israelites to do. They did it eye for an eye. That's what they were doing. And they were proving a point. But it was a pagan practice. They shouldn't have been doing that kind of stuff. But this was common practice, even among the Israelites. And that's the response that Succoth and Penuel are saying to Gideon. Unless you're going to do that and start chopping off some fingers and thumbs and give us some proof, some evidence... Not a chance. We're not giving you a bit of bread. We're not giving you anything. No supplies at all. They're afraid. They're afraid that if they help Gideon and his 300 men and they fail against the Midianites, well, the Midianites are going to come after them and say, you supported the rebellion, so we're going to punish you. And it's ironic because the very thing that they fear happens to them. Because they don't support Gideon, Gideon treats them as an enemy of Israel. But these are fellow Israelites. This is just a different tribe. And they, in verse 15, they taunt and mock and scorn Gideon. <laughs> don't do that if you think that this is the man that God has raised up to lead the church into victory. They just didn't believe that he was called, that he was the man that he was the leader, he was the next judge. They didn't believe him. They're not convinced, they're not, they're not confident. Now you've got Ephraim, who are more interested in their status. You've got Succoth and Peniel, who they want to see before they believe. So Thomas was probably a descendant of one of those places, wasn't he? I want to see evidence, I want to see proof before I'm going to have faith. Ephraim says, why didn't you call us earlier? Succoth and Peniel says, why don't you come back later? The joys of leadership. Poor Gideon. It's not that you can't please everyone. You can't please anyone. Whatever he says, whatever he does, nobody's happy. No gratitude at all from his fellow Israelites. And it's a reminder to us that God's chosen leader, messenger, is not always popular, even among God's people. Think of the prophets. You can read through any of the prophets in the Bible. Almost all of them are rejected and despised and mocked. Even think of the greatest messenger, the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to that which was his own. And did his own celebrate and rejoice? He's here. His own did not receive him. Rejected him. Now let's think about Gideon's response to Succoth and Peniel. It's very different to his response to Ephraim. Now some people may argue that well, those two places, they got what they deserved. They didn't support him. They didn't believe in him. You made your bed. Lie in it. Tough luck. But is that how God calls us to behave? Because all this, this frustration, all this anger, all this resentment inside of Gideon, it just comes out. Now, don't forget, he's tired. He's hungry. He's exhausted. He's been pursuing but what he should have said, a godly response, would have been something like, look, I know this is hard to believe that we're going to get this victory against Midian. They've oppressed us for so, so long. But 
You're going to have to trust me that God, in his grace, he's, he's using us to win. And for some bizarre reason, he's chose me to lead this victory. Now, don't, don't look at my strength. Just look at his. That in my weakness, he will reveal his strength. Trust him. Now, he should have said something like that. But instead, he says, how dare you question me? How dare you doubt me? I'll make you respect me. I'll show you. I'm going to come back here when I've done what God's called me to do. And I'm going to shame the lot of you. I'm even going to kill you. I'm going to tear down your towers. I'm going to destroy you. That's the threat that he makes. Now, we might then hope that given time his anger subsides. Because we can all be a bit rash sometimes in the moment, especially when we're tired and hungry. We can all be a little bit impatient, get a bit hangry. It happens. But it didn't happen for Gideon. During that time, his anger didn't subside. He actually carried out everything that he said he was going to do. He punishes the elders at Sukkoth with thorns and briars, and then worse, in, in Peniel, he tears down their tower and he kills the men of the town. Very, very different from a godly response that the Holy Spirit teaches us, so through the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to Timothy on how to deal with disappointments, he says, at my first offense, no one came to stand by me, all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. He's not eye for an eye, give them what they deserve. They've aligned with the enemy. It's not. It's that Christ-like Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Not vengeance is Gideon's. Now Gideon does seem to be driven by more than just a desire to carry out God's will in this passage. There's just little hints of it. But his, his goal is to lead the Israelites into a restoration mission. But there's something else going on. And we don't realize what it is until we get to verse 18 and 19. And we get those added little details that make us go, ah, okay. Because when he speaks to Zeba and Zalmanah, we find out that they killed his brothers. This is personal. So this was a mission of personal vengeance not really a mission to carry out God's will. He's doing his own thing now, but he's dragging 300 men along with him and using them to sort this personal vengeance situation out. And it's gripped him, it's got hold of him. And his mind is so clouded with this fury and this bitterness and this rage that he even tries to get his own son to kill them, to, to really shame them and embarrass them and bring back some sort of honour to his own family name. He's not focused on the name of the Lord and the honour of God in all this. It's the honour of himself. It's the honour of his own family. Just personal retribution, that's what he wants. And his son refuses. He can't do it. He's not ready for that. So Gideon just kills him himself. So this peace that we get, it comes at a cost. And it's actually the last time we read that line in Judges. For the rest of the book, there's no more peace. None at all. Because the leader got lost in self-importance, success, and, and personal vendettas. He, he lost sight of, of being on mission for God, being in God's will. His 300 men who are following him, who are watching him, remember that, that line back in the last chapter, watch me, follow me, do exactly as I do. That's what they're doing. They're watching him, they're following him, they're trusting him. So they're exhausted and they're pursuing, not pursuing the will of God, they're pursuing Gideon's personal vendetta. And as a leader, he should be teaching them to rest in the grace of God. Yes, we pursue, we work hard, but we also rest in his grace. We trust in him. We rest in his will. In chapter 7, Gideon was very aware of his own weakness and he knew that success was only by the grace of God and, and he worshipped even before he got the victory. He acknowledged God's goodness and greatness. But now he's claiming all that stuff for himself and he expects others 
to give him the credit and give him the glory. So he's forgotten who called him, he's forgotten who equipped him, who's empowering him and reassured him, who won the battle. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We also see from verse 22 that Israel is starting to credit Gideon for all this stuff now. So they're exalting him. He is their saviour. He is the one that they need. They want to be ruled by a man, not God. So Gideon responds in verse 23 with some really, really good words again. Very similar to his words against Ephraim. Good, godly words. He says, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. So you think, at last. He sorted himself out. Gideon's back on track. He's back being a godly leader again. They're going to watch him and follow him and do exactly as he does, and everything's going to be lovely. Problem is, Gideon's theology is right, but his heart isn't. His words are good, but he doesn't mean them. He just knows the right things to say. Like us, when <laughs> we turn up to church on a Sunday. We know all the language. We've got all the Christian words. We speak Christianese. It's really easy. You just throw in words like grace and sanctification now and again, and patience and godliness. But where's our heart? Gideon reveals his heart because immediately after he gives those beautiful words of verse 23, he contradicts those words because he asks for financial reward, which is only what a king would do. And then we get the echoes of the golden calf in Exodus 32 because Gideon made an ephod and put it in his city. An ephod was worn by the high priest in the tabernacle. And that was the place where God met with his people, where his, his manifest presence was there, where his people worshipped him in the tabernacle, and the high priest would have the ephod, and it'd have all the, the 12 precious stones, which represented the 12 different tribes. And you had the umin and the thumin, which they used to discern God's will. And that was the role of the high priest, to discern God's will and direct the Israelites into the will of God and worship him rightly. And at this time in history, the tabernacle was in Shiloh. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, Gideon doesn't just want to be king, he wants to be priest as well. He wants to take on the role of high priest. And he's, this leading seems to have gone to his head, because he set up a rival place of worship. He said, ah, oh, don't worry about going to Shiloh to the proper tabernacle. Come to my town. I'll be the high priest, and I'll be the king. So his actions are the complete opposite of his words. The role of judge that God had called him to was to lead people not into idolatry, but away from idolatry, back to God. But the result is all Israel hoard after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. And Gideon went on to, to live an ungodly life. Loads of wives, loads of concubines. Thessalonians says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Quite often as Christians, we pray about the will of God and we say, oh, I don't know what God wants me to do, I'm not sure. But a lot of the time we know, because it's obvious. Some things are not obvious. This is obvious. God does not want him to have loads of different women, loads of different kids with loads of different women, and live as a king and as a high priest. God does not want him to do that stuff. So even though Gideon has said, I'm not going to be your king, God's your king. What does he name his son? Abimelech. Do you know what that means? My father is king. 
So he's named his son, my father is king. Just in case you don't realise who's king in town. His dad, my dad's king. His actions don't mirror his words. He's the opposite of Jesus. You read through any of the Gospels. We went through John's Gospel. It took us a few years, didn't it? We went through John's Gospel. But one of the, the amazing things that stood out for me was whatever Jesus said, he backed it up with action. He didn't over-egg it like we, we tend to do. He never exaggerated anything. If anything, he played it down. But what he spoke about, he did. And it was all the heart of the Father. It was all the will of the Father. All empowered by the Spirit in humility. With humanity added to himself. And our danger as Christians, one of our dangers is that we, we can get used by God in some way and, and it's amazing to have that privilege, but then it, it goes to our head a little bit and then we speak humility, but we practice pride. And we know the right things to say, but we don't, we don't back it up with what we do. So we, we know the Spirit's power, but we, we then lack the Spirit's wisdom and humility. And we know stuff intellectually and in our head, but... But as it gripped our hearts, as it affected our thinking and our doing. In Galatians 2, the Apostle Paul speaks about the faith of professing believers. And he says, I I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. The way they were behaving just wasn't in line with the stuff that they were saying that they believed. And we're all a bit like that, aren't we? We're all a bit inconsistent. So are all of our leaders. So am I. And it should temper our expectations in many ways. It should always remind us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We're going to get let down by every single Christian leader. We keep our gaze on Jesus because we all want to wear the ephod. We all want the glory. We all want the worship. We all want to reject God's rule and God's reign and God's ways, and all the while we'll still say the right things. Our heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Can't even trust it. <clears throat> Ephraim, Succoth, Peniel, even Gideon don't have the will of God at the center of their desires, and they should. But there's only really been one who has consistently, so I'll take you back to where we were a few weeks ago in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the horror of the cross was looming and Jesus had his closest friends on earth around him, but they couldn't be bothered to stay awake and pray. That was God's will because God had told them his will. He'd asked them directly. God in the flesh had said, stay awake with me and pray. They went to sleep. And Jesus was tempted to avoid all of that, all of that pain, all of that suffering of going to a cross and being punished in our place and and dying and taking the wrath that we deserved. And he was tempted to, to not do that, to just go back to heaven and be with the Father in glory and be praised and worshipped. But he didn't do that. He said, not my will, your will be done. He had the will of God at the center of all of his desires. Jesus received no credit, no honor, no revenge, just full of grace and love because he is the rightful king and the high priest and only him. He's the tabernacle. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I have come not to be served, but to serve. That's what godly leadership looks like. Humble, sacrificial, not like Gideon. And, and I, know, I don't want to be too hard on Gideon because he, he's like us all. And he was tired and he was hungry and he's just lost his brothers. He's grieving. He's angry. He's frustrated. But he's no Jesus. And so the peace, the rest, well, that's it now. It's gone. This is the last time. Because when we abuse a privilege, it gets taken away, doesn't it? You, know, you, you say to your, your teenage children, perhaps, 
where after they've nagged you consistently for about 10 years for a phone, and you finally cave in, and you say, all right, you can have a mobile phone, but you can't do this and you can't do that. But if they do those things, what do you do? You take it off them. <laughs> You're not having the phone then. The phone's gone. That's what God does here. The Lord gives, the Lord also takes away. Romans 2.4, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Their hearts are revealed at the end of this chapter because they forgot God. They didn't forget like the, the theological details or it doesn't mean that they forgot the dimensions of the ark. They, they didn't forget the details. They, they, it means that they didn't think about God anymore. They didn't care about God's will anymore. They didn't consider him, consider his ways. There was no loyal, loyalty to him. Everyone just did what was right in their own eyes. And that's the way that they lived. And then verse 35 suggests that they, they forgot Gideon too. He's just old chip paper. They're not bothered about him. But in many ways, that's not a bad thing because we only watch and follow and emulate a leader as long as they're watching and following and emulating Jesus. And Gideon had stopped doing that. So he wasn't a leader worth following anymore. And I'm, I'm sorry to, to say this, but you, you might be thinking, well, surely judges can't get any worse than this. But wait until my father is king becomes king. It gets worse, I'm afraid. We'll close with Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray, and then we're going to sing. Your will be done, my God and Father. Father, thank you that your will is always good and perfect. And Lord, if we, if we are going to honour you, if we are going to take you seriously, then our desires and our thoughts and our actions and our words need to line up with you. And Lord, too often they don't. So we pray, Father, that you would help us, that you would pour out your spirit to, to transform us, transform our thinking, Lord, we, we have such a tendency to be like Gideon. We have a tendency to be like Ephraim, to be like Succoth and Peniel, to lean towards safety. We want to see it before we believe it. We want glory. We want honor. We want the bigger roles. We don't want to be sacrificially servant-hearted. Lord, please help us in our grief as well. Please help us in our hurts when we are tempted to get really angry, even violent. Lord, please temper those feelings so they don't spill over to actions. Please help us to, to give a gentle word that turns away wrath. And sometimes maybe that gentle word we need to hear from heaven. So, Father, please, by your Spirit, keep speaking to us and calming our angry, wandering hearts. We pray this for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our last hymn. <coughs>
Tonight we're going to be looking at Revelation 3 in the, the letter to the church in Laodicea. But after that, in chapter 4, it says this. After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And round the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Round the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And round the throne... On each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second like an ox, the third with the face of a man, and the fourth like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, were full of eyes all round and within. And day and night they never ceased to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Father, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are holy. Help us to be holy too. For your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. 